Let's say you have adopted modular level design already. You have a number of modules you can easily build levels with. Great. But still, you have to do it by hand. And once the player has finished all the levels you provided, they have nothing to do in your game. What if you could provide the player with an indefinite number of levels, or basically generate new levels for as long as the player plays your game? That would increase the replay value of your game tremendously. In this situation, random level generation techniques can come in handy. With Unreal Engine Blueprints, it is possible to build a random level generation solution which takes a list of modular level sections, a list of rules how they can be connected, and desired level dimensions as an input, and spawns a level. One last thing before we begin, I want to be absolutely honest with you. So today we are going to implement the most basic, naive approach to random generation. And this is for the following reasons. Random generation requires quite some utility blueprinting, so the video will be already quite complex, and I do not want to overcomplicate it. I will cover more sophisticated approaches in the next videos. Regardless of the fact that some naively generated levels can be unplayable, the approach itself can still be used if we utilize random generator seeds. We will discuss it later in the video. In this video we are going to use the modular blueprints we created in the previous part. You can find the link in the description or the top right corner. But if you already have the modular section and they kind of fit uh, in a square or a rectangle and you want to place them in a grid, you can also use them and uh, apply the same approach we are going to use today. So the first thing we are going to implement today is spawning a level from a prepared data. I have a level spawner actor here that accepts a list, or I call it a grid of structures, and every element specifies uh, which uh, modular section has to be spawned and its rotation. Uh, let's see how it works. So basically, it spawns a level using predefined data, using the modular uh, blueprints we already have. Now let's see what exactly we need to build this behavior. First of all, I have a structure called tunnel section data. Uh, this structure holds information about uh, which level uh, section has to be spawned, also the Z rotation of this section. Other two variables, let's ignore for now, we don't need uh, for this part. Also the tunnel spawner blueprint, our level spawner. We use event begin play, and on this event, we execute these two functions. The first one is really simple. One of the variables in our uh, level spanner blueprint is the grid dimensions. It's basically a vector saying that uh, how many rows, how many columns, and how many floors our grid has. This function sets a number of utility variables for later use. Out of this vector, we set number of rows, number of columns, number of floors. Then we also set the floor size, which is basically rows multiplied by columns, and also number of cells in the grid. It's floor size multiplied by number of floors. Another function spawns the grid itself. It reads the value of the grid variable. Uh, this is another public uh, variable. Uh, tunnel spawner blueprint accepts. This is an array of tunnel section data structures. Uh, the spawn grid function iterates over this array and reads all the values and spawns the respective uh, level section. So, uh, in order to calculate the spawn location, first we get the actor location. Basically, we make the level spawn independent on the level spawner location. So if we want to move the level, we can just move the level spawner. Then we need to calculate uh, the relative location of the level section. For that, first we need to convert uh, array index to the grid coordinates. Basically, row, column, and floor. Why we need to do that? This is because Unreal Engine doesn't support multi-dimensional arrays. So here I am using a 
one dimensional array, I'm basically flattening the three dimensional array onto a one dimensional array. Yeah, let me explain on the picture. Let's say we have our one dimensional array, but we want to map a three dimensional array onto a one dimensional array. Let's say in our three dimensional array we have uh, four rows, three columns, and two floors. Then what we need to do, we need to split the array accordingly. So we need two floors, then let's split uh, the one dimensional array into two halves. So the first half is going to be zero floor or a ground floor. And the second half is going to be the first floor. Then we, we need uh, three columns in every floor. So what we need to do, we need to split the array accordingly. So this is going to be the column zero on the, on the ground floor, column one on the ground floor, column two on the ground floor, etc. And yeah, the same thing we can do with the rows or basically single cells. We need to ensure that every column just uh, has four array elements assigned to it. Also, by just looking uh, onto that, we can understand that uh, to store a three-dimensional array with two floors, three columns, and four rows, we need a one-dimensional array of size 24. So now let's say we have an index 13. How can we understand uh, which floor, column, and row this index belongs to? We know that uh, first half of the array is for the floor 0, the second one for the floor 1. Basically, we need to determine which half of the array this uh, index belongs to. For that, we need to divide it by the floor size. And in our case, it's 12. It's going to be 1. The next step is determine the column. So this is going to be our index inside the second half. And yeah, it equals 1. And then uh, for the column number, we need to do exactly the same thing as we did for the floor number. We just need to divide it by the column size. And in our case, the column size equals to the number of rows our grid has, so we need to divide this by 4 and get 0 as a result. And for the row number we can uh, actually repeat. For the row number we can take the index uh, in the second half of the array and uh, take it by modular of the column size, which is number of rows in our case. Exactly that is implemented inside this function. We can check. So first we divide the index by the floor size. This is going to be our floor index. Uh, then we take the index uh, by modulo of the floor size and then divide it by row to get uh, the column index. And uh, taking this by modulo of the row yields the row index. Once we have figured out uh, row, column, and floor indexes, we can uh, calculate the relative location by, by multiplying it by the cell size. The cell size is another public variable in our blueprint. It basically says uh, how big is the cell, how big is the size of the module. Uh, in our case, it's uh, 4 by 4 by 4 meters. Yeah, this is it for spawning a level from a prepared data. So next step, to understand how we can randomly generate this data in order to produce as many levels as we want. So our end goal is to have something like that. This is a completely randomly generated level. We just specified uh, the size of it. It's uh, 10 by 10, by the way. I am already lost in this level, to be honest. So it's quite random. Let's take a bird's eye view. Of the scene. Here, uh, what is we are going to implement next? We just want to provide the size of the level, modules for that level, 
and then let the spawner figure out the rest. In order to achieve that, we need to add uh, two functions to our uh, level spawner. The first one is to make some preparations, basically to make the random generation easier and uh, more efficient. And the second one is uh, for the random generation itself. Let's deep dive into the random generation first, because I think uh, it's going to be easier to understand why we need the preparation before the generation. Okay, the first step is to clear our grid because it can be filled with predefined data or with a previous level or something like that. Uh, then we need to resize it uh, and uh, make the size equal the number of cells we have. Uh, this is the most simple example. So we are generating only one floor. So we are setting the floor index to zero. It's going to be zero for the rest of the flow. Then we need two for loops. Basically, we are looping uh, for every column from zero to col calls minus one. And we are looping for every row from zero to rows minus one. From the row index, column index, and floor index, uh, we can figure out the cell index. So in order to figure out uh, the index from the three coordinates, we just need to multiply floor by the floor size. We need to multiply column by the column size, which is number of rows. And then uh, add everything up with the row index. After we know the index, we can uh, get open sites uh, for this cell. Open sites is basically the rule which cells can be connected to which cells. Open sites is a structure. Uh, every variable tells if the corresponding site is open or closed. Let me maybe explain on a picture. So we have our coordinate system. And so we have uh, our modules. Let's say we have a turn. So this is the X plus. This is the Y plus. This is uh, X minus and Y minus. And for the turn, this equals to close. This equals to open, this equals to open, and uh, this equals to close. Every variable in this structure has uh, the same type. It's, it's an enumeration. Uh, there are three possible open site types. Closed, open, and then any. So it doesn't matter. Also, every modular blueprint we use it has open sites defined. So for example, for the cross blueprints, we have all sites open because uh, on the cross, you can go in any direction. Or for the dead end. In the dead end, you can only go back. So X minus is open and uh, other sites are closed. I have this specified on every modular blueprint in order to use it for the random generation. So back to the random generation. For every cell, we get open sites for this cell. What does it mean? Yeah, let me show on the picture maybe. Let's say we have a grid and we want to spawn a section here. So in order to understand which section we can use, we need to check is this side open or not? Is this side open or not? And this and also this. So let's say you have a turn here. Then this is side is open. But here you can, let's say, have a other direction. So this is closed. Here, for example, you can have the level border. This is on the edge of the level. So this is also closed. And uh, here you also have something like, uh, I don't know, T-junction. So this is also open. So we have uh, the open sites of surrounding cells as an input. And then we need to figure out what modular section we can fit here. For example, it can be a turn. Most probably this is the only section we can fit here. So exactly for that, we get open sites for the cell. And uh, like finding the matching modular section, this is exactly what this function is doing. 
It's quite simple. Yeah, let me explain. It takes the open sites as an input. Then it converts them to a string. Yeah, it's really simple. We just uh, append all the open sites with commas. Then we need this because we want to use a cache to optimize computation. You see, this function is going to be called many, many times. So in order to optimize it, we create a map. So next time we call, we can use the value we computed previously and uh, skip the heavy computation. Yeah, but first, how we can get this? Because by default, you cannot map a string onto an array. Uh, in order to be able to do that, uh, we just need to use a simple trick. We need to create a structure that has a variable of array type and use it in our map. So basically, the it maps string onto structures, and inside the structure, we have array. So if I break uh, this link, uh, I can show you. So this is actually a structure. And then, yeah, we can just break this pin and use the output value. OK, but this is uh, the case when we already have a value in our cache. If we don't have it, we need to compute it. For that, we get all the possible tonal sections. It's a bit different uh, from uh, like uh, all the tonal sections uh, we provided to the blueprint. So just to show you, yeah, this blueprint takes uh, a list of all tonal sections we want to use. And uh, in our case, it's uh, five. Cross, dead end, forward, T-junction, and turn. Uh, but this one is a bit different. It uh, also contains all the possible rotations of the sections. Uh, this is calculated uh, on the preparation stage. Yeah, I mentioned it before, but we'll take a closer look later. So we have all these possible rotations and we loop through them. And what we need to do is we need to check if the open sides uh, of this uh, tonal section matches with the open size requested. And if this is a match, we just store this tonal section in the temporary array. And after this loop is done, first we store this value into the cache, into the map, in order to use it later if requested, and return the temporary array. Let's take a bit closer look on how to uh, compare open sites. We have uh, two open site structures as uh, inputs. And the, basically, for every open site, like x plus, y plus, and so on. We need to execute the same operation. Uh, that's why first I convert them to arrays. Yeah. In order to convert to array, I just uh, make an array of four elements and return it. So I convert uh, both structures uh, to arrays and then loop through them. I loop through the first array and then get uh, an item from the second array by index. So here I get the array elements from the first array and uh, here from the second one. And what are the like matching scenarios? First of all, if the, the elements are equal. So if uh, open site uh, meets the open site, it's good. If the closed site meets the closed site, it's also good. But there could be uh, other scenarios, like for example, so let's say we haven't spawned anything here yet. So we don't have any preferences what to spawn. So it can be open or closed, or it can be any. So I use a star to indicate that uh, this site can be any. And yeah, this is simple. In case uh, one of the two, or maybe both, but yeah, one is enough. If any of these uh, sites uh, are stars, then we don't need to compare anything. So we are good with the other side to be anything. So the result of this Boolean expression, we add to the temporary variable. Initially, this variable is true. And we use uh, the AND operation to add uh, the result. Basically, it means if, if any of the open sites doesn't match, this variable is going to be reset to false. 
Yeah, and uh, once the for loop is done, we return the result from our temporary variable here. So yeah, this was how we get the possible tonal sections we can spawn for every uh, index, for every cell. Once we got this list, we can randomly select an item and simply set it in the grid. One important thing here is that uh, I use random stream instead of simply getting random element. This is why if you use a random stream, you can set the random seed. And it means that uh, you can reproduce your results. Let's say you like the level uh, you got by using the random seed 0 or the random seed 1 to 3. Then next time, if you provide the same uh, initial seed, you will get the same level. It's like how Terraria works, for example. And now, if you remember, inside this function, we used uh, this list we calculated previously. So we need to understand how we can calculate it. For that, let's go to the generate possible tonal sections function here. Uh, this function gets the list of tonal sections provided to the blueprint and loops uh, through it. And then what we need to do, we need to basically generate every possible rotation of every uh, tonal section provided. But the question is why I use the map here. It's not like, uh, it's not because I want to catch the results of this function, no. Because this function is called only once. But because I want to remove duplicates. Let me explain on the example of uh, this cross section. It doesn't matter like how we rotate it. It stays the same. Like 180 degrees, 270, or back to zero. It's the same. For example, uh, this forward tunnel, it only has two possible states. Like this. Uh, but then if we go like 180, it's the same thing as uh, zero. 270 is the same thing as 90. So, but we don't want these duplicates in our data. Because uh, that would increase the probability of them being spawned. Because basically, if you have, uh, instead of a single cross module, you have four of them, the probability of them being spawned increases and it will distort uh, our levels. And in order to get the key for this map, uh, what we get, uh, we get the tonal section class. And uh, from the class defaults, we can uh, get the open sites we provided. So we need to rotate the open sites according to the rotation we are generating. Yeah, the easiest way to rotate uh, open sites is to convert uh, them to array and then uh, kind of shift the array depending on the rotation angle and then convert the array back to open sites and return it. But first, let's see how we calculate the shift. First, I uh, add the input angle to 360. Uh, yeah, basically, 360 is uh, the whole turn. It doesn't change anything, but uh, we can get negative numbers provided, like minus 90 or something like that. And I don't want to deal with the negative numbers. So I just add it up uh, with uh, 360, then divide it by 90. And uh, yeah, this is going to be our shift. Yeah, we can check the picture. For example, here we have a turn and it have uh, closed, open, open, and then closed. And what if we rotate the turn 90 degrees clockwise? It's going to be closed, closed, open, open. In this case, we have, uh, yeah, if we convert to array, we have uh, closed, open, open, closed. And in this case, we have uh, closed, closed, open, open. Yeah, we can see that uh, this array is uh, basically a, a cyclic shift of this array. 
So we just need to shift this array one element to the right. Yeah, and if we rotate uh, 180 degrees, we need to shift uh, two times. And if uh, 270 degrees, we need to shift three times. Or like uh, 270 is also equals to 90 degrees. That's why we subtract from 360 because uh, 360 minus 90 is exactly 270. Yeah, the same thing goes uh, for the 180 degrees. Yeah, and actually yeah, here as well. So here we do exactly that. We add uh, this shift value uh, to the current index. And then in order to prevent going outside of the bounds of the array, we take it modulo 4 and set uh, the same value, but uh, yeah, to another index in the temporary array. Yeah, in the, and in the end, as I said, uh, we just convert it back uh, to the uh, open side structure. It's also a simple function. Once we got the rotated uh, open sides, we can convert them to string and append uh, to the name of the tonal section class. So it's going to be something like turn and then underscore and then uh, open sides. This is going to be the key for the map, for deduplication. And also in the map, we store the tonal section data. We put the blueprint class, current rotation, and the open sites in order to be able to use it in the generate grid uh, function. Once uh, this loop is done, uh, we just get the values from the map. So we don't need the map anymore and uh, store them in the global variable, uh, which is going to be used in the generate uh, random grid function. That's it. Now let's see what uh, the blueprint we created can do. It can generate levels of any size. Also, as I said, if we provide uh, the same random seed uh, to two uh, spawners, we'll get uh, the same result. And if we check, uh, yeah, let's see, this one has four and this one has four. Now I left uh, the first one with uh, four, uh, but the second one I changed to zero. And yeah, we got totally different level. But uh, now it's time to talk a, a bit about the limitations of this uh, naive solution. As we can see, uh, this one is not very uh, playable. It has uh, some uh, closed sections like here and here. And maybe, yeah, also here and here. If we assume that uh, the character is spawned in the left uh, bottom corner here, then, uh, yeah, this is the only space it's going to reach. But yeah, as I said, if you play with uh, random seats a bit, you can get uh, a lot of uh, levels like that, uh, which uh, where you can reach almost everywhere on the level, and uh, you can get them basically by changing a single number. It's not like you have to put it all together uh, manually. If you are as interested as me in how randomness can enrich games, I will be talking about improvements to the naive approach discussed today in the next videos. Let me know in the comments about your view on randomness in games. Well, if you've watched until this moment, you must be a real game dev and Unreal Engine enthusiast. Please consider liking and subscribing for more content like this. See you in the next videos. Bye bye.